understanding what is out of sight. He is the answer. He is the light. If you have felt the weight of sin, bound by the shame that's hemmed you in, he broke the chain.
Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. Last week I told you that it was my opinion, my humble opinion, my convinced opinion, that Paul is the author of the book of Hebrews. There's, there's discussion about that in the theological community as to whether he was the one or not, but I want to read the first few verses again of this book and tell me if I'm not right. Well, you won't know until we get to the end, but I want to tell you at the beginning that in the first few verses of the book of Hebrews, Paul encapsulates the entire book of Hebrews in just a few verses. Much as he did in the book of Romans in chapter 1, where he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Greek. For therein, that is in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. A righteousness, he says, that is ours from first to last. And then he spends the next eight chapters blowing that up and explaining why he is so passionate and excited about what Jesus did for us. He does that in Hebrews. It's just one of the reasons why I believe Paul wrote this. It's, it's, got, his, it's, got, it's got his face on this book. This is his face we see in this book as he writes this great discourse, this great discourse on the exalted position of Jesus Christ and what it all means in terms of him being better than, better than everything, better than everything in our Christian faith, in, our, in the Jewish faith, better than everything that points to the divinity of God himself. So let's read just the first few verses again. God who at various times and in various ways spoke to us in the past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken us to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow, what a glorious introduction to a letter to the Hebrew Christians through which he expands on that one thought, the exalted position of Jesus Christ. And you'll find the word, I, I should have counted before I, before I prepared for today. I had done that once before, but I counted one time in the book of Hebrews, the word better. And the word better occurs several times in the book of Hebrew. He's better than. He is the, he's better than the original creation of man. He's better than man, although he is one. And that's what he talks about in chapters one or two. He is better than the angels. He is better than the high priests of the Old Testament days. He is a better high priest. He is a better sacrifice. He is a better, he gives us a better covenant. It's just all through the book of Hebrews. And here in this first verse, he lifts Christ to the pinnacle, to the peak of superiority and the expression of God himself, the very expression of God himself, the very image, the express image, he says, of God himself. And he is God's last word to the human race. He says, the last word. He spoke to us. God spoke to us through the prophets. The law and the prophets, right? Moses, prophets, the law and the prophets. He spoke to us in times past, he said, through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who is the express image of himself. 
He is the one who flung the stars into space, who created, who spoke, and it was done, who commanded, and it stood fast. He is the one. And he's better than the angels. He says that right in verse 5. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So he's better than the angels. And he spends the rest of chapter 1 talking about how he is better than the angels. And then in chapter 2, he, he talks about his humanity. His superior humanity to the creation of Eden. And he says, and I, I just want to read this too, the last, uh, uh, it's the last verse on my page, in verse 14 of chapter 2, he says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And in a number of places in this passage, he talks about how he is, that Jesus embedded himself. This one, this one who is the magnificent expression of God, embedded himself in humanity, in the human family. He embedded himself in us. He partook of our flesh and blood. He is our flesh and blood in a very real sense because he has partaken of humanity and he has joined our family. We, we have a tiny bit of his DNA in us as he has a tiny bit of Adam's DNA in him. He became a part of this human family and he carried us then through the, through the 33 years of his life on earth. The perfect sinless son. Perfectly righteous. Perfectly obedient taking us to the cross where we died our death in him, bringing us forth from the tomb as we raised with him. And now, believe it or not, though we sit here and we look at one another this morning in our human form, in the mind of God in him, we sit at the right hand of God today in him. He bound himself to us is the full expression of the best humanity he is better than any other humanity and he is better than the angels and he is better than and he carries us now as we enter into chapter 3 he carries us into a union with his household and we're going to talk about this in a moment but I want to go to John chapter 1 where we have another another expression of supporting this passage John 1 is a, is a familiar verse to every Christian, I would guess. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And in the Greek, uh, if the order of those words are, and God was the Word. God was the Word. Divine was the Word. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we've heard some of these words before, right? These are familiar texts to us, but it's really, really important today that we grasp the gravity, the import of what Jesus did when he came. This God of heaven coming to us in human flesh. It's so important that we understand the the importance, not just the importance, I'm, I'm looking for the right word, the, the incredible reality of the fact that he has come to us. He's come to us and we are in him. And Paul carries this now, this theme, 
into chapter 3, where he gives us a new dimension. Listen, just as in the book of Romans, Paul begins with a summary of the book, summary of the of the story that he is about to tell, the, the, the interpretation of the life of Jesus and what he did. He starts with a summary of what he says in chapters 1 through 8 as he expands on it. In Hebrews, he does the same. He gives us a summary, and then he expands on it. And he carries us in Romans from the beginning to the end. First, there's no one righteous. He talks about the secular world, doomed. The religious world is guilty before God. The whole world, in chapter 3, is guilty before God. We're all under the curse of the law and under the curse of sin. We're all destined to death. But now, and that's when he begins to talk about the solution in chapter 3, and he carries us through what Jesus did as our propitiation. In chapter 4, he gives Abraham as an example of a righteousness that is ours now by faith in him alone. Chapter 5, he brings in Adam. We sinned in Adam. I'm just kind of summarizing this. We sinned. He carries us through. My point is that he carries us through the sequence of salvation. And here he does the same. Here he does the same. Now he takes us in chapter, chapter 3. He takes us from Christ being embedded in our human family and being a part of us and we a part of him, bound to him through faith. Faith in him, we, that is the bridge that carries us, that, that closes the gap between the reality of his being in us and us being in him, bound together. Faith reaches across that chasm and grasps the gift, grasps the reality of what he has done. He takes that one step further, and that's where we want to begin reading in chapter 3 of Hebrews, where he says, Therefore, holy brethren, therefore, on the basis of, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, Father, as Moses also was faithful in his whole house, in all his house. We have a, a new, a new uh, chapter in this journey. He, Christ, the Holy One, the Son of God, was all of those things, the express image of God. Now he becomes a man in chapter 2. Now he has a household. He has a house. He begins to introduce Christ as the, as the one who has a household of faith. So Christ was faithful to the Father, the one who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful to all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. <laughs> He's better than Moses. Say another one. He's better than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house itself. The house of Israel, Old Testament Israel, New Testament Israel, the church of the New Testament. Now we're in the New Testament times. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his household as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. I want to diverge here for just a moment and talk just a moment about this, 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 set, this last sentence that we have. We are his house, he says, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. I just want to clarify something about Salvation. There is a 
concept that says, once saved, always saved. And there is truth to that statement. But we are once saved by faith alone in Christ as long as we continue to be saved by faith alone in Christ. It is not just a it is not just a moment of saying, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and from then on, and from then on, everything is safe no matter what you do in your life. You, we have the choice of rejecting that. In fact, Paul talks about it in chapter 6, how those, if they have tasted of the Spirit, tasted of the good things of the gospel, if they turn from it. There's nothing more that God has to offer them. If they reject the very best, there's nothing more. But that shouldn't lead us to in, into any insecurity. I mean, there. look, the point is this. We are saved through Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, not by nationality, not by a moment of kneeling at an altar, not by anything, but that continued faith in Jesus Christ. That's what carries us through to the end. And Paul is telling us here, we need to hold fast to that confidence, he says, and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And that's where I just want to reaffirm the fact that this is not a shaky foundation. This is Jesus in John chapter 10, I think it is. John chapter 10, he's, he's, he talks, John says, he will hold us with a hand that will not let go. There is assurance in our faith in Jesus Christ, but it is by grace through faith in him alone from the beginning to the end. And Paul is challenging us not to let go of that faith in him, no matter what the circumstances might be. Christ was a faithful servant, and he says he has a household now of saints who are part of his family, part of his family. And who is that? It's us. That's the church of Jesus Christ. That's us. We are his house. Notice what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. Just turn with me if you've got your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. I just must read with verse 4. Coming to him, we are, we are people. Coming to him, we come to him as a living Stone. He is the living stone, the cornerstone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, you notice how he takes this, like just he does it, like Paul does in, in Hebrews. He takes the, the superior man, Jesus Christ, and then he talks about those who are his followers, those who become a part of his household. And here, Jesus is that living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. And then he says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're the house of the Lord. We're the house of Christ. We are his household. And, he, and Paul now calls us to be faithful as Jesus was faithful. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Just want to read those verses as well. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, Paul says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are being built together for a dwelling place of, of God in the Spirit. Just a, a comment again. When Jesus came to this earth, he came as the divine Son of God, Son of Man. We come to him as men and women, 
humanity, creation, create cre creatures, creatures of his hand. We are human, but just as he was human and divine, he places within us a piece of himself, so to speak. He places within us his Holy Spirit, who now unites us with divinity. That Spirit of God living within our hearts unites us to divinity. Uh, Paul, Paul brings that out in Ephesians as well. So, let's continue. I want to continue in verse 12. Before we close, just a, a few more verses. Verse 12, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. He wants us to hold on to that faith in Christ. Don't let go, he says. Persevere. Continue to be faithful in your hold on Jesus Christ. He's going to continue to hold on you if you even are reaching out to him. You are even... even wanting him to hold on to you. How many times in my life I have prayed and I have been in dark moments in my life. There was one point, I hate to confess this, but there was one point early on in my ministry, early on in my ministry where life was so hard, I began to question whether there was even a God. And I had to go back to the beginning point and reestablish the reality of God, God's existence, and then build from there back to my faith, my strong hold on him. And yet during those times, I, I prayed to him. I said, Lord, hold on to me. Don't let go of me as I go through this questioning journey. Hold on to me with that hand that will not let go. That's all it takes. That's all it takes is us reaching out to him and saying, hold on, I, I claim your promise to hold on to me with a hand that will not let go as I try to figure out this crazy life here on earth. And so Paul is challenging us to that. He says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you any evil heart of unbelief, the opposite of faith, in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin for we have become partakers of christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end yeah don't let go don't let go don't let go and in verse 11 of chapter 6, I just want to read this one verse. We'll come to that again later. Verse 11 of chapter 6, he says, And we desire that each, of one, each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Well, that's, that's a preview of... of Chapter 11, he's leading us to chapter 11 where he talks about those who held fast their faith in Christ all the way to the end, even though they didn't receive the promise at, in this life. They looked to a land far away in which they would receive the promise. They held on. They, oh, we'll, we'll cover that. It's just, it's just too much of a grand finale of fireworks in chapter 11 that just that just shows us what God's faithful servants have done through the past as they have endured to the end. What did Jesus say? He who endures to the end shall be saved. It isn't our endurance that saves us. It's our endurance that hold, causes us to hold on to the gift and not let go of it. And that we must do. That we must do. That's why he says, Challenge each other daily. Exhort one another daily not to let go of your faith. It is sure. It is sure. And when he talks about hope, he's not talking about I hope so. He's talking about the certain hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Something that is in which we can be confident. 
We can be confident. We are to maintain our confidence in that hope, a hope that is for sure. It is not, it is, it is, when, when, he, when he uses the word hope, and he does this a number of times in his writings, he uses the word hope, that blessed hope. It's, it's, it's a reality, not a fantasy. It's a reality. It's not a, a something that is, that is nebulous and uncertain. The hope is just looking forward to. The hope is looking forward to that which is certain at the end of the road. So I challenge you that, to that today. As my church family, I challenge you to that today. I exhort you to that today on the basis of the word of God. Jesus is ours and we are his. And let us never let go of that awareness and the certainty of that hope we have. Father in heaven, this morning I pray that that will be the experience of your church, of this church, of this family. I pray that you will make us confident in our, in our faith. There's no turning back, Lord, for us. There's nowhere to go. Isn't that what the disciples said? Are you going to leave me too, Jesus said? He said, where would we go? Where would we go from here? There's nothing to go to. And so, Lord, we resolve once again to reach out and take hold of that gift of eternal life, that gift of salvation that you have worked out on our behalf quite apart from us and then given it to us as a gift. We claim it by faith and we rest in your promises. In Jesus' name, amen.